Now today we'll continue with my sermon series, uh, Persevering Faith, and it's going to be the second last uh, segment for this series. Next Sunday, um, it won't be me preaching, so two more Sundays time we'll wrap this series up, alright? Now, this week we're going to look at James chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, but before I begin my sermon, let me just invite Justin to read the scripture for us. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm reading from the ESV. James 4.1 What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will exalt you. Thanks, Justin. Now, this is a very difficult passage to, to, to read out. It's a very difficult passage to preach. For years, I've always tried to avoid difficult passages like this. Because sometimes you preach it accurately, quote-unquote, and then you offend many people. Then you don't preach it accurately, you offend many people as well. And so for years, I've always steered clear of such difficult passages. But decided that this year, since I'm already into my seventh year in ministry, I think I've matured a little bit, a little bit, <laughs> in my understanding of Scripture. I think I kind of know how to navigate through some difficult passages without being too extreme on either ends. And I think these difficult passages, while they may be very hard to digest, sometimes carry a very important and very strong lesson that will hit home in our journey of faith. Now, usually in our life, when someone gives us a harsher word, we learn, we remember. When it's a kinder word, usually it just goes in and go out. You know, my mom used to say when, when she's really angry and when she's scolding me at the top of her lungs when I was a kid, all right, not now. You know, and, and she, she would say, I hope what I say doesn't just go in and go out. Oh, no, it doesn't. It goes in and it stays because I don't want to see you in this state anymore. <laughs> but usually when she's kind, it goes in and it floats out immediately. And I think sometimes in the Bible, it has moments of assurance, moments of kind words, but it also has moments of strong messages that tells us, do this, do that, you know, and there's no other option. And I think these are the messages that makes the most impact in our lives as a believer. And today, of course, don't worry, it's not going to be a session where, oh, you're, you're going to feel so uncomfortable in your seats. But I, I assure you, from James chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, if we were to break down everything that James is saying very carefully, we will realize that he has a very powerful and a very important message for us as a church but most importantly, for us as individual believers. The church life and the individual Christian life is not two separate entities. You know, you don't just attend church and then after that you go home and live your own life. The church life is supposed to inspire you, motivate you to live 
a better life or like what first peter would say live such good lives for the glory of god and that's why how we are as a church or how we look like as a church will determine how we are as a believer outside of the church. Now, if you don't understand, hang on for a minute. But let's go on. There are two points when we talk about what kind of church do we want to be? And what kind of church does James hopes his church that he's overseeing is? And he touches on the first thing, that is, a church must be a praying church. Come, say with me, a church must be a Wonderful. I love the response. I think it's probably the seats are closer now. You all feel more alive, you know. <laughs> a praying church. Now, what's the problem in, the, in, in James' church? And he starts off by saying, you all are quarreling. You all are fighting among yourselves. And, and it's literal fights, okay? I studied the word and it's a literal fight that is going on. They are coming to church and they are throwing punches. They have murderous intent as they walk into church because of their wants. And James says, all these things are happening in your church because you have put your focus on your wants, on your covetous desire. Jesus on his Sermon on the Mount preached against coveting your neighbor's possession. And this was happening in the church that James was overseeing. I wouldn't say he was directly pastoring this church, but he was overseeing this church and they were bringing their covetous desire. I see my neighbor's riches. I want it for myself. I see what my neighbor has, his lands, his possessions. I want it for myself. And I will find ways to, you know, to cheat my way into getting his possession, even though he's a fellow Christian. And James says, all these problems happen, not because you lack in something and he has something more. It's because of the desire of your heart and because of a wrong emphasis or a wrong focus in your church life. When he talks about the problem of fights and quarrels and the wrong focus, it also means that when they come into church, it's not about encouraging one another. It's not about lifting one another up with their words, but it's about bragging to one another. Oh, you see, last week I had two more donkeys added to my farm. Now, back in those days, this was the kind of conversation, all right? It's very different. Two donkeys will, equivalent, will be equivalent to two, two extra cars for us today. You know, oh, I bought two more lands for myself. Oh, I, I, I gained, you know, three more servants. And then the woman will walk into church with hair braided as high as KL Tower. Uh, no joke. That's a symbol of wealth. Rich woman back in those days, the higher your braids, the more jewelry on your braids, that's a sign of wealth. And that's why you can understand Paul says, cover your heads. So it's very contextual, you know, but of course, I'm not, I'm not going to touch on that because it's, it's a different thing altogether. I don't want to be misunderstood this morning. So the conversations were not wholesome. It was not uplifting, not encouraging. But the conversations they had only caused more quarrels, more fights, divisions. Paul's church faced division as well. The church in James also had a problem of division. Jews separating themselves from the Gentiles, from the Greeks, from the Romans, from the Asians that were in their church. The Jews saying to themselves, oh, we are the better Christians than these people. We are the true followers of God. These people are not. And this was the problem that was happening. And James says, all this is all because... You are focusing on your wants. Now James says, you need to pray. You need to ask God. But then he also says, you do not have because you do not ask. But then in verse 3 he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. What's James talking about? Is he being contradictory? He's not. He's telling them, it's the same thing. You say you pray because I asked you to pray. And you say, you oh, we pray. He said, well, you pray, but you do not receive because you are asking for all the wrong things. You're coming to God in prayer saying, God, 
My neighbour has three new lands. Bless me with four new lands. You're in your prayer closet and you're praying, God, my neighbour has two servants to help braid her hair as high. I want just one more servant to help me braid my hair even higher. And that's why James says, you're praying to God, but you're asking for all the wrong things. You're praying for your wants. You're praying for your covetous desires. That's not how you should be praying. And James says, that's not what makes up or constitutes a praying church. And what makes up a praying church? A praying church is a church that goes to God and asks God for needs. Not wants. Needs in life. I'm going to elaborate more. I've always said this and I will continue to say this and I will continue to stress this even more. A praying church is a powerful church. Say it with me. A praying church is a powerful church. Because I really believe in that. A church that doesn't pray is a church that's not powerful. A Christian that does not pray is not a powerful Christian. Part of the armor of God, if you read the book of Ephesians, it says praying at all times. With prayers, with thanksgiving, with supplications, with intercession. Praying at all times. And that is what makes up a powerful Christian. A Christian that can stand firm and stay rooted in their faith. A church that prays will stay together. A church that focuses on the needs of people, on the needs of those outside of the church, is a church that will continuously be sought and light to the community. A church that only focuses within, focuses on its wants, that is a church, unfortunately, that is like what Jesus says, that keeps its light hidden or covered by a bowl. So when we talk about prayer, what or how can we pray? Pray for needs. Needs. You know, when we talk about wants, don't I have to pray for my wants? Well, usually when it comes to your wants, there is something called working towards your wants. Usually when, it, when we talk about wants, it's the extra things that we think to ourselves we need. And I need God to move mountains and seas to get my wants. I have a car, but I want a bigger car. That's a want. The need has already been met. Now, I'm not saying having a want or a desire for a car, a bigger house, or more lands is wrong. I'm not saying that. But usually these are things that we can, first of all, work towards, save up, you know, take two jobs, or, or work harder, and, and we will get it. The second thing about wants is that if we place so much emphasis on our wants, we fail to see the needs that God has provided for us. When we place so much emphasis on what I want and what I have not gotten, what does it stir up in us? It stirs up in us a displeasure towards God. A discouragement towards God because why? God hasn't given me what I wanted. And that's why James says, focus on your needs. And you will realize God has blessed me abundantly. You will realize God has been so gracious to me. God has been so faithful to me. And that's why I can give thanks to Him even though I don't have all my wants met. And I can also begin to pray for others because others haven't had their needs met yet. Needs versus wants. When we talk about prayer, pray for the needs. Pray for your personal spiritual needs. Pray for the needs of others around you. We talk about intercession. You know, church fellowship is not just about, hi, nice to see you today. How's work? Great. I had fellowship. No, that's not fellowship. Well, that to a certain extent is fellowship. It's a fraction of fellowship. But 
true fellowship is going beyond just the hi, bye, how are you? And maybe with a closing of, wow, I'll pray for you. But then we go home and we forget about everything that we just talked to that person. Real fellowship is where we can talk, get to know the needs of that person, understand the struggles of the person, and then take that struggles home with us. And in our own prayer time, intercede for that person. Stand in that person's shoes. Pray on that person's behalf. Feel that person's struggles. Feel their emotions. And cry out to God on their behalf. That is what we call intercession. Prayer also involves thanksgiving. In Philippians 4 verse 6, Paul says, Bring everything to God. Do not be anxious over anything. But in everything, bring your prayers, bring your petition, and thanksgiving. It means prayer is a whole package of asking God and giving thanks to God. That's the whole package of prayer. But a lot of times we talk about prayer and we think of prayer as only a time for bringing my requests, what I want, what I have to tell God. And I tell God, and I, as quickly as I start telling God everything, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And that's it, my prayer time is over. Thanksgiving, we need thanksgiving because thanksgiving will remind us of the goodness of God in your life. Only when you can learn to give thanks to God, you will begin to see and be able to count the many blessings that God has poured out into your life. Only when we as a church can begin to give thanks together in church during times of prayer, during times of worship, is when we will truly value the fellowship that we have together. It is when we truly value the place that God has given to us. Give thanks. It's a very powerful element of prayer. And so James 4 tells us to be a praying church. Praying church is a powerful church. James also continues to say, you need to stand firm. The church needs to be a praying church. The second thing the church needs to do, it needs to stand firm. And when he talks about standing firm, there are three elements that make up standing firm. Number one, in verse, four, in, in verse five, who is your master? Who is your master? Look at what James says here in verse five. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. He yearns for us. God yearns and longs for the spirit of the church. God yearns and longs for each and every one of you. And that is what it means when we say, God is my master. God longs for me. And do I long for God? Do I want to be surrendered and submitted to God? And look at what James says as he goes down all the way to verse 7. He says this. He yearns jealously over the Spirit. And in verse 7, he says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. God longs for you, so submit to Him and you will see His perfect will unfolding in your life. Surrender to Him and you will see His plans unfold for your life. Submit to Him and you will see the blessings that God can pour out in your life. Surrender to God. Let God be the master of your lives. That's the first element of standing firm. Standing firm also says this, resist the devil. So to be a church that stands firm, to be a believer that stands firm, is a believer who resists the devil. You see, this is where the very famous you know, phrase that we all use many times appears. Submit yourselves therefore to God, that's found in verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. A lot of times we don't think too much or we don't think deeper. This sentence or this verse sort of explains itself to, to naturally. But this verse has many layers to it. When we talk about resisting the devil, it's not just saying, oh, stop, 
when the devil comes. Oftentimes we think of it in the form of temptations. When temptation comes, we say, stop. Sometimes we don't allow it. We don't even put a full stop to temptation. We allow it to overcome us and overwhelm us and drag us into this whole net of sin. But then when we talk about resisting the devil, it goes beyond. It also means to be vigilant. Jesus emphasized on resisting the devil in very different ways when he tells his disciples to watch out for wolf in sheep's clothing. And he says in the last days, there will be false prophets. In the last days, there will be many who come to you proclaiming, you know, they are the Messiah. But Jesus says, watch out. Be vigilant. Part of standing firm is to resist the devil. Part of resisting the devil is to be vigilant. To be a Christian that is always aware of what they are putting into their minds, what they are listening, what they are speaking. That is what vigilance means. And in this day and age, I cannot stress how important it is for us to be vigilant Christians. I'm going to go back to that same analogy I used the week before and I've been using it many times. Truth. What is truth? And this is one area we have to be very vigilant. I keep stressing on this because this is so important. Truth is so blurred nowadays. What is right? What is wrong? The line changes daily. But as Christians, we need to be vigilant. We need to stand firm. We also need to be vigilant in the church. To watch out so that the devil does not destroy the church. So that the devil does not divide the church. Vigilance. The third aspect of standing firm is to seek God. In verse 8, it says here, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Draw near to God. We must be a church that seeks to draw nearer and nearer to the heart of God with each passing year. We must not be a church that seeks to draw further and further away from God and draw nearer and nearer to the world. We talk about relevance. Yes, it's very necessary. But we must always watch out that we are not becoming like the world. And I think this is a very, very important message for the church and for Christians today to draw near to God, to be a church that draws nearer to God is to be a church that is uncompromising in the Word, to be a church that's uncompromising in our fellowship, is to be a church that is uncompromising in our love for others. You see, this is what it means when we say we don't compromise. It's not just one aspect. Oh, the Word only. We are only strong in the Word. That's all. But we don't help the poor. We don't show love for people. We only want to teach the word. Unfortunately, that cannot happen. The church that is uncompromising, a church that draws near to God, is a church that emphasizes the word, emphasizes on love, shares the gospel to people, builds one another up, establishes families within the church, shows care for the community outside of the church. That is a church that draws near to God. A church that constantly seeks the face of God. A church that seeks God is also a church 
that is humble. Look at what it says in verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. The idea of humble yourselves and He will exalt you is not that, oh, okay, so I'll be humble and God will lift me up to a very high position. No, that's not the kind of humility that we are talking about. The exaltation, if anything, is more of an eternal exaltation that James is focusing on. You know, where in eternity we are exalted to the right hand and we can stand and have full access to the throne of God. That's the exaltation that James is talking about. But the emphasis that he's placing on is on the humility. And when we talk about humility, what makes up a humble church? It's not a church that doesn't do beautiful renovation. It's not a church that removes all the spotlights, removes all the instruments and just go with one single piano. And even the piano has got to be an old, out-of-tune piano. That's not a sign of a humble church. A sign of a humble church is we can have all this, but yet at the same time, our focus is still on glorifying God. That is a humble church. So, when we talk about being a humble church, is everything that we are doing, is it bringing glory to God? If the answer is yes, great. Let's keep glorifying God. Let's keep glorifying God all the more. Amen. When we talk about standing firm, if the church stands firm, in its faith, in its trust, in its love, stands firm in truth and stands firm in this desire to glorify God, this will spill over into our Christian life as well. And a Christian that stands firm looks like these three things. Number one, follow God. Follow God. You know, Paul was very, was, was very firm. He was dealing with a problem in one of his churches. And he says, you know, what's your problem? You follow leaders. One say you're following Peter. One say you're following Apollos. One say you follow Paul. And another group, even better, you say, I follow Jesus. I don't follow any world leaders. I follow Jesus. But in saying that they follow Jesus, what they really mean is I don't want to submit to any human authority. So I say, I follow Jesus. God holds me accountable. That's all. That's all that matters. Who appoints you to be a pastor? Who appoints you to oversee this church? No one. I follow Jesus. And Paul deals with this very seriously. And he says, all of us, we are merely planting the seed of salvation, the seed of faith. It is God who grows. We are not here creating a personality cult. We are not here drawing followers to ourselves. The pulpit is not a place for competition where we say, who preaches better? I want to come and listen to that preacher. The pulpit is a place where we bless people through the Word. We bring everyone up in the knowledge of the Word. And even the preacher himself has to be nourished by the Word before delivering the word. So, when we talk about following God, let us be church. Let us be a church and let us be Christians that truly follow God. And we will show up in church even if three years' time the pastor of this church changes. I will still be in church because this is the place where I have my fellowship, where I grow in the faith and where I learn to give back to the community. I will still follow God. I will still show up in church even if my friends do not show up in church. That is what it means to be a Christian that stands firm. I will still follow God even if my friends are turning away from God. I will still follow Him. That is what it means to stand firm in your faith. To stand firm in your faith is also a, a Christian who defends truth. 
defend truth. We have to be willing and daring and bold to say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. But to be even bolder to say no to things that do not please God. To be even bolder to say, no, I will not be part of anything that I clearly know goes against the message of the Word of God. That is what it means to defend truth. But to, be, to defend truth also means another thing. I'm willing to tell others about my faith. Tell others about Jesus. I'm willing to share the gospel because I know what Christ has done in me. And because of that, I share my faith. I defend my faith in front of others. A Christian that stands firm is also a Christian that says, God is bigger than me. I don't know if y'all can see that arrow clearly. God is bigger than me. This is a very cliche statement. I'm sure we heard it many times. But ask ourselves, reflect. Do we really leave out what we say or what we know so well? That God is bigger than me. We don't talk about God bigger than my ups and downs because definitely in our, in our downs, we want God to be bigger. God, rescue me. But in our ups, that's where it's a problem to see God is bigger than us because in our wonderful success moments, we see ourselves bigger than God. But if we want to be a believer that stands firm, a believer that walks in humility, we need to be a believer that says this and leaves it out. God is bigger than me. I live my life to glorify God. I live my life to exalt Him. I live my life to decrease so that God may increase each and every day. That is how we stand firm in the faith. I'm going to call the worship team up here. You know, like always, every Sunday, I always believe that there will be people who come in here who haven't yet known the faith, who haven't yet believed in Jesus. And I want to invite you. Everyone just close your eyes. I want to invite you if it's your first time in church. Maybe you're seeking for truth. You want to know, who is this Jesus that you all talk about? Who is this Jesus that you all declare and proclaim to be so life-changing and has this power to transform? Well, I want to tell you that Jesus is here for you and you can experience this life-changing power for yourselves if you can commit your life to Him and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord, be my Saviour. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to change I trust that I have a new life. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You now, if you pray that prayer, God is with you right now. God has always been with you. He has led you all throughout life to this point. Continue to journey with Him. Continue to walk with Him get to know the faith and you will get to know what real life is with Jesus I also want to talk to Christians here we've heard the message this morning but hearing without doing like what James himself says is pointless let's just start from the very simple are you a praying believer are you a praying believer? How is your prayer life? Is it good? Is it okay? Can be improved. I wouldn't say bad. 
can be improved. Tell God. Make your commitment right now. God, I want to be a praying Christian. I want to experience the power of prayer in my life. I can tell you this if you start praying every day you won't see mountains move before you you won't see oceans part before you but I can tell you this you will experience God in a very unique very personal very special way for yourself but you need to start somewhere you need to start praying are you bombarded with information so much so that it's so hard to know what is right and what is wrong because that's what can happen to all of us in this day and age it's not so much the temptation of sin although that still exists but it's the temptation of information and this temptation of information is even more dangerous because it draws us away from the source of all truth that is God you're in this situation and you're being bombarded with so much information that you you do not know which is real what should I digest go to God and say God I want your enlightenment give me your wisdom give me a discerning heart but most importantly as we pray this prayer we need to ask God for a humble heart all of us myself included humility that God you be bigger than me than all my plans than, than my career pathway bigger than all my wants and my desires consume all of me church right now in your own seats talk to God Make your commitment to God. Pray, lift your voices and pray to Him. Can we all do that? Let us be a praying church. Let's start now. Let's practice.